I'm Sam Legasic. And I'm Dreadful Dan Gallagher. And we're two old buddies that have lived our life at the edge of the mainstream. So come join us where things are a little odd. This is the... <laughs> This earth of yours will be reduced to a burned out cinder. Hey everybody, it's me, Dreadful Dan G. Welcome to Oddcast. I'm joined, as always, by Sam Legasic. Hello. Uh, how are you doing, Sam? Oh, don't ask me what I'm what I'm doing. That's <laughs> it's personal. <laughs> um, I'm ingesting data through discs into my ears and my brain. Good grief! That sounds horrific. Sounds like some terrible <laughs> cyber cyberpunk movie from the eighties. It's how yeah, like you know, in the Matrix, where it just plugs straight in. They have yeah. to start with pushing cartridges into your brain first. Yeah. <laughs> Old media. Is that the thing that's blowing the cartridge? <laughs> Stick it into the back of your head. Wow. Well, imagine a world, if you can, where technology has developed far beyond anything you could have imagined at that point. And yet, Sam, a small band of obsessive fans have decided to take that digital information, that digital music, and press it onto old plastic discs that can only be played with an expensive turntable mm. and selling them to people at outrageously inflated prices. <laughs> if you can't imagine such a thing, then maybe you're imagining the small London record label, Data Discs. So Data Discs is a London record label. Um, They specialise in releasing, like I said, video game soundtracks on vinyl. Um, So what they do is they go in, they take the stuff, usually off of the original cartridges. um, Mm. And what's nice is, you know, they don't just then chuck this out into the, uh, onto the internet. All this stuff is properly mastered for vinyl. Um, and pressed in like really nice editions for music and video game fans. Um, and they specialize in like old, mostly 16 bit stuff from the 90s. Um, they kicked off their first release was in 2015, which was the classic Streets of Rage. Mm. Um, I've been following them for a few years now, buying a few of their releases. And I think it's, yeah, really, really nice stuff. But um, Sam, yeah, have you have you had a look? Have you heard about these guys? Yeah, so um, as uh, Dan knows anyway, um, recently I have taken, basically gone off the deep end a little bit into, <laughs> into vinyl and a lot of it has been in um, video game music vinyl and I'm part of that like Reddit group basically and they've got a little list of people to check out and this was on the list and especially helps the fact that they're UK based because obviously yeah. the shipping costs, which is usually what... I've, can add almost double the value yeah. of a fucking disc, which is ridiculous. So, um, if not more, so uh, in, in customs, and I checked these guys out, and um, I was like, this is really weird and interesting. Um, and it's quite a good selection of stuff that they've got here as well. Um, yeah, unfortunately, a lot of it at the moment is sold out, mm. um, which can be a problem with their stuff. 
Um, but I also quite like their ethos around this because they will do a pressing. They won't tell you how limited it is because they yeah. specifically don't want um, like flippers. Scalpers. Exactly, exactly. Which is really nice. You know, they they say we want people that want this music. We want them to be able to get it. Um, and they put a lot of care into these records. Often, you know, they're coloured. Um, they come in usually like really nice sleeves. Um, and they've always got like a kind of fake Japanese obi paper strip down the side. Um, and they've often got like inserts as well, like special prints of like the original artwork, this kind of thing. Mm. Um, original artwork from the games themselves, I should say, not from records, because a lot of this stuff has never been released before. Mm. But yeah, they go out of their way, I think, to then, you know, they've done a press. They won't immediately repress it. But if they do repress it, which they in- in- inevitably seem to do, yeah. It's always slightly different. It's a different color or it's slightly okay. different packaging. So you still feel like you got something unique the first time. Um, but yeah, sometimes when you go here, like I remember I really wanted Streets of Rage 2 mm. and it took about a year before it suddenly they announced that we're going to repress it again. And I was oh, like, really? I was so excited. Mm. <laughs> I haven't felt that excited since like waiting for a record to come out like in 1998. So that was nice. nice. Yeah, it's really... Yeah, I was really surprised um, uh, how much, as I said, it's quite a new, relatively new thing to me, um, how video game music vinyl just generally is so yeah. loved. Because I've always had an affinity with soundtracks of games and whatever. But um, yeah, uh, as I said, it's only been recently I've actually started going into the, the vinyl stuff. But the fact that there's such a niche, but very, very um, passionate uh, crowd out there for this kind of thing. I mean, it's and, quite a strange yeah. concept, really, isn't it? What do you think of, just, just as, as an idea, taking old uh, music created and heavily compressed to fit on tiny little cartridges mm. and giving it this, like, really lavish, like, audiophile treatment? Yeah, well, I think there's a definite nostalgic thing to it. So people aren't necessarily thinking too much about the audio quality. I mean, obviously they are, but as in like, they're not listening to it the same way someone would listen to like the new Justin Bieber record or whatever. <laughs> oh my God, this track's amazing. It's more just to kind of reminisce about that time, but also having something. That's the thing is that it's very, I always feel like, especially with like gaming and it being something that's very personal to a lot of people, um, especially like the era that they've kind of, you know, they've um, dated this that are especially doing um people like the fact that they have something nice and viable and a keepsake almost yeah that will remind them of that time and that it's something that is i think part of it is that it's a respect that's given to something that was just seen as whatever but actually holds a place quite dear in your heart and so mm. by the fact that you've kind of bought something like this you're not necessarily getting it to listen to the music though obviously that is part of it and to like remember when you were playing the game because you could just I mean, I, I mean, you could say that with any vinyl, but the fact that you feel like someone has given the time and effort to make something like, really nice of it, it's almost like a badge of honour for the fact that this is a record of a game that meant something to me when I was a kid and it actually holds a special place in my heart in a really weird way, which people who, especially people who aren't really gamers as well, like at all, probably wouldn't understand to the same degree, I would say, because as well, it's like, it's not like here's this Led Zeppelin record or whatever. Yeah. Right? It's not like these games were like, you know, me, I mean, they're they're not like the pop culture, you know, table Zeitgeist. magazine, exactly. Yeah, kind of stuff. It all feels like it's, it feels very personal and special to each person. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head, really. And that's kind of, yeah, thinking about it, I think that is why I've sort of bought a few of these records. Um, it's almost like, you know, for example, one of them's Altered Beast, which mm. I loved as a kid. Mm. Um, and it's almost kind of like, I could have got a t-shirt that said Altered Beast on it, but I thought, oh, this is a nice, other another way of representing my love of that game mm. is to own this really nice collectible uh, record in a really nice sleeve with all this like nice packaging and extra bits and bobs and things. Yeah. Um, but then at the same time, you have got something that you can sit down and listen to and... I have found myself like sitting down, you know, often I just sit there of a quiet evening, with a glass of whiskey on my sofa. And instead of putting on some like uh, post bebop or whatever, 
I'm yeah. I'm bopping out to the, uh, the the sounds of altered beast sitting there like stroking my beard like mm, interesting uh, interesting break. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's the thing as well with a lot of these. I'm not sure. Like obviously there's a creativity behind it, but I'm always interested in how the composers feel. Um, about it kind of getting this kind of treatment. I've not looked into mm. it. I'm saying it like I'm about to give, <laughs> like, here's what thing he said about whether I haven't got that information. I'm just intrigued that, you know, what would these guys think that it's given this much love yeah. and the fact that, because um, for them, like, no, like, to be brutally honest, like normally it was just someone sitting in a, sitting in a room, like they've got one person who can, who has the tech set up to do it. And they're just trying to make all these tunes and make them yeah. sound decent enough. It's not like it's a fully composed piece with like an orchestra or whatever and, you know, and especially like the stuff that they had back then compared to today. Um, yeah, for some yeah. of them it's probably just a commission. Yeah, so Bish, bash, bosh, like done. Yeah. There you go. Uh, like who cares? They're just like, we just need something that's going to yeah. plug them in. Um, yeah. Well, I don't know. That's the thing. But some of this um, has actually, you know, I think uh, over the years, respect for it has grown. Um, certainly the work of uh, Yuzo Kashiro, who we'll come to later. Mm. Um, he's really become, I think, lauded, um, like well-respected in, in Japan, but I think more and more people in the West are starting to kind of uh, you know, respect what he what he did. Um, anyway, should we get into the detail of like what uh, computer games we're actually talking about here? Because sure. um, they haven't actually released all that much. Like I said, they've been around for five years um, and the titles, they do tend to repress them a lot. So, um, yeah, mm-hmm. let's just list them off. And I don't know, if you've got any thoughts about any of these, Sam? Yeah, I'd be happy to, happy to comment on them. On so this. they kicked off. And what's quite nice here, and I think what makes them maybe a collectible label, like I like this about other indie labels, is they've got a really um, consistent look across mm-hmm. all of their releases because of, like I said, this like fake OB strip. Yeah. Or, or belly band, whatever you want to call it. Right. Um, and very clear, like, catalogue numbering system. Mm. You know, there isn't, like, a load of numbers. It's just data yeah. one, <laughs> data yeah. two. Yeah. This is the second edition. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's nice. kind of, like, makes it a bit more a bit more collectible. I can imagine, like, someone getting a bit obsessed with this and wanting everything that this uh, label, re- uh, label releases. Yeah. I'm not quite there myself yet. Um, but, yeah, their first release was Streets of Rage. Mm. Uh, classic yeah, Mega Drive classic. game. Yeah, I mean, I get them all a bit mixed up between Streets of Rage 1, 2 and 3 because obviously I haven't played them since I played them on the Mega Drive and all this stuff. Um, Genesis, or whatever it's called in America. Um, yeah, so it was great to see. It's a really top game to have as your first one out the, of out the fucking gate. Yeah, and really great artwork. I love, a lot of people remember that box artwork, I think. Yeah, so I mean, it, it just it just looks really cool, really yeah. desirable. Uh, then they did uh, Shenmue. Shenmue, I've always said, but I'm not sure if that's actually how you pronounce it, but it, it might be Shenmue. Um, yeah, well, this is like, this holds a special place in a lot of gamers' hearts. For me personally, um, our friend Simon oh, yeah. had it on Dream, he had a Dreamcast and um, he uh, I used to basically watch him play this. Um, I played it a little bit, but to be honest, I was quite happy just sitting there watching it. Um, and it's like it's one of the most expensive games that were ever that was ever made, and it was a bit of a flop. Basically, it, well, it sold well, but the Dreamcast didn't sell well, which meant that this game yeah. didn't sell as well as it could have. Um, and it had stuff that a lot of like open world sandbox games use today, um, but there was a lot of like busy work basically, and then it had like a real world um, time system. So sometimes the next thing you'd have to do in the mission is like, go to this place. And it's like, it's 9 p.m. It's closed. You have to come back in the morning. <laughs> okay. Well, I've got to fuck about for ages or whatever whilst I wait for this shop to open. Um, it had things like that. Uh, I think it's probably dated a little bit. I think they did an HD thing recently because Shemui 3, oh my God, 3, yeah, I guess, um, came out recently. That was kind of crowdfunded. Uh, but a lot of people think it's one of the best games ever made. Um I never actually played it properly, so I can say, but um, I think it's a pretty strong addition to have there because, yeah, a lot of people hold a lot of love uh, for this game. Cool. Uh, 
And they moved on to Shinobi 3? Yep, Shinobi 3. So I vaguely, vaguely remember playing Shinobi 3. Um, or, well, I can't remember. I think I had it. On what system? I was going to say, I think I had it on Game Gear. Or a version thereof. Um, oh, this sure. seems the to be is, from the so Mega Drive many, version. Right. The thing is, there's so, there were so many ninja games <laughs> on um, around that time that they all kind of get a little bit mixed up um, mm-hmm. in my head. Uh, but yeah, I haven't really got much to say about it because I, I can't remember the... Um, uh, I can't remember anything about it, basically. Yeah, I don't think I've ever, ever played that one. Um, no. Super Hang On was their fourth release. Yeah, so Super Hang On, again, I don't really remember much of. I just remember the name. Um, do you know anything about it? I only remember the name as well. Um, I'm just reading the blurb here, and obviously, it's so it's a, a Sega game. game. Yeah. Um, so everything so far has been Sega. I think everything, I think maybe everything is Sega, actually. So they do have a working right. relationship with Sega, which is okay. nice. And that's the thing, another thing that's cool, I think, about the label, you know, everything's fully licensed. So yeah. the original artists, the composers, uh, receive a royalty from these sales. Like, it's yeah. all completely legit. Um, and some of the, like, packaging and the replication of artwork, they've actually gone into Sega's archives and got the original artwork. Like, they haven't just kind of, like, scanned it from a, an old <laughs> an old Mega right. Drive box or something. Yeah. They've had access to the proper stuff. Um, so it's, you know, they go, they go to lengths to make this all really nice. Oh, cool. Um, the fifth release is Streets of Rage 2. Makes sense, yeah. right? To follow up yeah. on the first one. Telling, classic. I should say uh, I've just looked in the Shinobi thing game I had for the Game Gear was just a Shinobi Game Gear thing. I didn't, I haven't played, I don't think anyway, the this Shinobi series. I just had to check it out because it was just driving me crazy. Um, Streets of Rage 2 is another great game. I specifically remember, um, I know we'll come on to Streets of Rage 3, but I specifically remember that um, they had they added the character, right? They added a new character and it was... Skate. Skate. And oh, on, what, in Streets of Rage 3? In Street, well, in Streets of Rage 3 as well, but didn't they add a new one in Streets of Rage 2 as well? Yeah, yeah. so Streets of Rage had Axel, Blaze and Adam. Right. Streets of Rage 2, Adam has been kidnapped, so they add Max and Skate. Right, okay, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Right. So and then fine. Streets of Rage 3, well, we'll come to that in a minute. Yeah, we'll come to that in a bit. But um, yeah, again, yeah, why not follow it up? It's a great game. Um, this is on the Sega Drive uh, Mini, and I have been playing this loads. Actually, we got a arcade machine at work. I think I... I've mentioned this before, you know, one of these ones is is, um, got all emulated games, right? So I've been playing Streets of Rage 2 at work (laughs) over the last, (laughs) well, not over the last year. I've been working from home over the last year, but before that. Um, And now I've been playing it on the Mega Drive Mini. So I think I've completed it about 10 times over the last year or so. Why not? I just love it. If I'm like relaxing and I want something to do with my hands, (laughs) um, (laughs) So not just sitting there listening to music. Or well, sometimes I put music on and, and I, I'll play this without the soundtrack. Right. Um, I just love it. I find it so it, satisfying. It's the point of what we're talking about, really. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that's why. What I can do is, Sam, yeah. and this is mental, I put it on mute and I and put the soundtrack, the soundtrack on. <laughs> <laughs> so weird. Okay. Um, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll dive into this a bit more. Because this is the album that I've picked for a little bit of a, a deeper chat around. Okay, so, uh, right. we'll, we'll, we'll come, come, we'll come back to that. Well, funny enough, sorry, go on. you haven't picked like, Streets of Rage two. No, I haven't. No, <laughs> I'm just looking at the list. Um, Data Six was Outrun. Yes, which is the one that I've picked. Oh, cool! I actually, I don't think I played this, but I actually, yeah, you was would've. was thinking I'd like to buy this. Because the addition they've done, it's really nice. It looks like a Japanese city pop album from the 80s. It's always like pastel colours. Yeah. And it was like pressed on mint green. And it's like all like pink and, and it's all sold yeah. out. But like the um, cover. Yeah, really yeah, lovely. So this is the, yeah, this is the one that I picked only because um, even though like I've played a few, fair few of these, uh, I always specifically remember... Um, this game uh, just, it had, it was just having the road move so fast. It was all like California 
like in your car, everything was cool. And I was thinking, this is the kind of stuff I'd listen to like now. If they like redid it, and I'm not saying like this original music, if they like made it um, like more of a synth wave kind of thing, which is what mm. I do sometimes on my um, time off, let's say, then it would be kind of in this vibe. Um, and so I thought it was a good one to pick. And also as a game, there's not much to it. If you know what I mean, like yeah. it is, uh, if you remember, there's a load of outrun arcade cabinets that are knocking around as well. Oh um, yeah, this was more of an arcade game, wasn't it? Yeah, and it's literally you're just driving. That's all you're doing is you're just driving to make sure you don't hit other people and all this stuff. Hmm. Um, and it's fairly easy to um, remember, but yeah, it, I just remember it was just that it felt bright, sunny, and like stupid and fun, and how you yeah. see like california in like 80s movies do you know what i mean nice. that kind of that kind of thing and i always remember that and it really made a mark on me so i thought it's a good pick to kind of go down and do a bit more of a deep dive on nice yeah because i haven't heard this music but i can imagine what it sounds like looking at this cover <laughs> yeah it's good um, it's good fun actually to listen to um the next one was data 07 and this one i i really thought about buying uh it's golden axe one and two mm. Um, but it's always sold out. But at some point, I got an email from them saying, "Oh, we print available." But I, I think I'd spent so much money on records around that time that I, I passed on it. Um, I love this game, I, uh, both games. Yeah. Um, again, I, these were go-to games when I was at work. So, like lunch break, got half an hour, do a couple of levels of Golden Axe, and then usually like carry on. It only takes about an hour to complete. <laughs> I deserve <laughs> it's the start of a meeting or something. <laughs> Yeah, it's yeah. quite quick. Like I, um, I remember Golden Axe, but I don't remember um, l- loving it. I don't think I ever completed it or anything though. I remember I was the dwarf. Was that Golden Axe three? I think he's in all. all is it two? Maybe he's, oh, he's in one in and two. Them. Okay, maybe it is then. Um, but yeah, I don't remember anything specifically amazing about it, apart from the fact that it was very super popular. I felt like. Um, during that time with Conan and all this shit going on uh, yeah proper Conan fantasy stuff mm. I, what I really like with the dwarf is like when you um, kick a baddie they go down on their knees if you carry on hitting them you like donk them on the head with the butt of your pickaxe right. or, or not, not pickaxe battle axe right. it makes a really nice hollow donk donk sound <laughs> <laughs> nice. um, yeah I don't know what the music's like though again like I'm getting so bound up in like memories of the game mm. Um, I don't know if it's any good or not. Um, Data 8 was Panzer Dragoon. Yeah, so I, I only played Panzer Dragoon Auto, I think, whatever it's called, on the Xbox. I didn't do any of the original ones. Um, do you know so, what this yeah. was originally released on? No. Panzer no. Dragoon. Sega CD. I don't know. Possibly. I don't remember it from the Mega Drive Days. I don't think it was like that big over here, um, to be honest. I don't think any of them was. Yeah, Drag- Panzer Dragoon Auto um, was what I played years ago. I think it was the first game I got on the original Xbox. Um, oh, it looks like, like I think it was a Saturn game. Okay. Another Keep Saturn going. game. After that, uh, Data 09 was The Revenge of Shinobi. Yeah, this was great. I remember this game. This is brilliant. Could it, was it that you picked co- different colours? Was that this one? Do you know what? I've never played it, but I've, okay. I've heard about it. I know it's got a really good reputation. Yeah, it was um, it was really good. I remember that. I don't remember. Um, I know we've talked about Shinobi 3, um, but yeah, I think this is one of the ones that I have actually got. It's all a bit of a mixture. As again, I said, there's just so much ninja stuff kind of coming up, <laughs> but I definitely remember that cover of him holding the sword and the weird kabuki thing in the background. Yeah. Um, and uh, like loving it. I want to play this. I wish it was on the Mega Drive Mini. Yeah, I suppose it's not. But it, it was quite popular at the time. I'm going to get it somehow. By hook or by crook. I've still yeah. got my Mega Drive. Maybe I'll uh, pick up yeah, a cartridge or something. It. Yeah, there'd be one knocking around. I think also our mate Sai had this as well. Maybe yeah. maybe I didn't have it. Maybe Sorry. I was playing it at his or something, which is why it's all getting a bit confusing. It was circulating. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> something like that. Um, Data 10, Galaxy Force 2 and Thunderblade. Um, yeah, don't know. Didn't play Two it. Two arcade cool classics. Cover. 
It looks like that game we did on the Oddcast a few months ago with that white blob. Oh, Rez. Man, yeah. Rez, yeah. It looks a bit like that to me. Yeah, it does look a bit resy, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, no, I don't know anything about it. Um, so apparently two arcade games. So probably fairly obscure okay. from 88 and 87. Anyway, uh, after that, uh, Data 11, Gunstar Heroes. Yeah, don't know. Soz. I hear a lot about this, like being a really seminal release on the Mega Drive. I think it might be on the Mega Drive Mini, but I haven't gotten around to playing it. I think it's like okay. a platformer that's just like really in your face. Uh, quite cartoony, big sprites, that kind of thing. Mm, um, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so probably quite a fan favourite, that one. For some reason, the next release, Sonic Mania, mm. uh, doesn't have the like a catalogue number. So Gunstar Heroes was Data 11. Uh, Sonic Mania, just don't know. And then the next release picks up and is day to 12. Yeah, I don't know. why well, Sonic Mania, I think, wasn't that just a bunch of Sonic games? As in, I don't know. I'm trying to like look at it up at the same time. But um, yeah, right. it's just Sonic, I suppose. Right, it's not like um, vintage music. It's uh, 16 new tracks selected by composer T. Lopes, basically to tie into... Release yeah, the game. Right, slow. Fine. Okay, well, fair enough. Good on. Uh, yeah, so Data 12, Altered Beast. Yeah. <clears throat> what a yeah. game. It was a great game. Um, and I have no idea what the soundtrack sounds like. Um, I love it. It's burned into my mind. Oh, really? Um, yeah, I mean, I acknowledge it's... Uh, I suppose it's not as rich sounding as some of the other Mega Drive games. I mean, this is quite an early, uh, one of the earliest ones. Again, this is a game I've been playing on the arcade machine and it's like, mm. it's, it's a big step up. I remember um, it being super fucking like dark and kind of like gothic yeah. or whatever fantasy. I just love how it starts. Arise from your grave and rescue my daughter. And he like, he summons you up. And um, yeah, it's so cool. You go through each level you pick up these power-ups, you become butch and beefy, and then you turn into some kind of, like a, 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 a well, a werewolf or a dragon or a bear. Yeah. But this came in the UK. Um, you know, American uh, Genesis enthusiasts might not realise um, the Mega Drive launched in the UK, packaged with Altered Beast. Um, and that's what I got. And I think it was only like a year later or maybe two years later, they started right. packaging it with Sonic the Hedgehog. Uh, okay. But at this point, there was no Sonic. It was, uh, yeah, Altered Beast was like the, the launch title. So I played it. Shed loads. And uh, yeah, I really love it. I love it. Yeah, it was a good one. It was it was one of the classic like, Mega Drive games, which, because, as, we, as you said, it's like, it felt a bit adult. Mm. And that was kind of like the Mega Drive or Genesis as well um, thing. It's, it was like, we're not Nintendo. Look at this fucking game. It's called Altered Beast and it's got some yeah. fucking like hench werewolf on the cover fucking dark shit going on here you'll love it that's a good point actually yeah did contribute to yeah and you know it's black and sleek and sexy the machine yeah because the snes was just like big white cartoony looking thing yeah uh data 13 metal slug yeah so i haven't done i haven't done this original metal slug i've played one of the metal slug series like it's a shoot em up cool i've no idea about the music um, but yeah, like it's one of those. Um, I don't know what differentiates it from other ones, but cool. Looks like it's from the Neo Geo rather than a Sega release. So. Okay, deviating a bit there. Data 14, Streets of Rage 3. Now, you had this game, Sam. I did, yes, because I remember playing it at yours or borrowing it or something, mm. uh, but I never had it. I remember the old guy being weird, <laughs> like, it's a weird character. <laughs> The character design is weird, isn't it? I mean, he's like a really old, bald, like, professor with a droopy white moustache, mm. but with, like, a blue robot body. That's and I right. remember he could shoot his arms out like Inspector Gadget and, like, zap people. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's very strange. That, I mean, I can't remember any of the stories or anything about any of this. Um, obviously, you do. Uh, but, yeah, that was... I remember it being... Um, I remember it being good, but losing some of the grit... Um, mm -hmm. that maybe the previous ones had uh, it felt like a little bit like it was going a bit like almost cartoony and arcadey especially with the, that character um, yeah, yeah I just remember he wasn't very 
fun to play mm. after the initial kind of like novelty of this it wasn't it cool around. really either so no it doesn't look cool like you're playing axel foley or whatever axel knows <laughs> whatever um the other axel uh and you're like yeah okay this guy's cool and then you're like he's what the fuck am i why am i this guy i don't want to be this guy <laughs> yeah it's weird yeah, I can't. I can't remember it very much. The game. I, I would again. I'd love to play that now. That yeah. like you know, maybe I wouldn't have to play Streets of Rage two for the fiftieth time. <laughs> yeah. Data fifteen after Burner two, and this is a gorgeous looking disc that they put together. Oh really? Uh, purple with blue swirl. Yeah, click on that. Click on that. Click into um, that and have a look at that. Oh yeah, it's nice. That's good. It's good one. Sold out, of course. Nice. Um, do you remember this game? So Afterburner was pretty big, I remember. Um, I just wasn't into flying games. No, I also think there was a big arcade cabinet, if I remember, for Afterburner. Um, well, both of them, I guess. Um, but yeah, like it never really, those games just never did anything for me. So yeah. I, th- I, I definitely would have played it, but I definitely would have would it not have had it. Next up, Data 16. And this is a wacky looking thing. Space Harrier. Yeah, I don't know. Space area. Whoa. Click at that. It's got a fucking 3D lenticular cover and it's animated. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. Some guy flying around with a big sword or actually it looks like a leaf blower. <laughs> He's sort of stabbing it into a dragon's head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right between the eyes. Um, um, yeah, I've only just played personal. this for the first time because it's, it's on the Mega Drive Mini. But I remember... You know, because I got it the Mega Drive early, I remember, you know, every game would have a leaflet of all the other Mega Drive's games that were available. Mm. And this was always there. They're always pushing it. These, like, weird early launch titles. Mm. And I always thought, oh, it looks so bad. Um, but, yeah, I was playing it for the first time. So it was like, wow, I'm actually playing this game finally. Yeah. And it was kind of okay. You fly around and it was, it was bloody hard. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, I no, I've never done it. So a lot of those games that are like ports from arcade games, they are really hard, aren't they? Because mm-hmm. like they made them difficult to get kids to pump so much money into the machine. That's right, yeah. Purposely difficult. But I'm um, used to games that were developed for the Mega Drive. So when I play these games, I'm just like, how can this be so hard? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's it. Like, you know, some of these games, like there's, there's ones like, if you remember The Lion King, it's notorious for being difficult. I haven't um, played that. Because Disney specifically or whoever specifically said to the designers, um, we don't want them like returning it or renting it or whatever. So you have to make the hardest game possible. So it's nigh on impossible to actually Oh complete. really? Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah, so it was there's that's why these these games are having to be made to last. Because obviously it's only so much you could do with the game. Uh, you can't make it like a hundred levels or whatever, or big yeah. up hard thing. So you have to make it last, make it worth the, the dollar that they're pumping in it, into it. But yeah, as you said, it's arcade ones as well. Same thing, pumping the quarters, the 20 P's or whatever it was back then. Yeah. And uh, next up, they did, again, they broke from the uh, numbering system here. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess a special standalone release. Okami. Yes, this is great. I think, so I, Okami has, um stuck in. <laughs> Akami has a very special place in a lot of people's hearts because of the way it was designed and the way it looks. It looks like a uh, like Japanese painting, basically, kind of thing. Um, I played it for like an hour, the HD version, because this came out on PS2 originally, I believe. Um, and I think, I'm guessing it's a Sega thing, I don't know. And uh, <clears throat> um, Capcom. Capcom, okay. Um, and I uh, played it for a little bit, and I've still got it, but I just never returned to it. Not, I didn't not say it was bad. I just played, started playing something else, never came back around to it. Um, but this edition, where it's just got like, was it four vinyls or something? And yeah. most of the art books and stuff. Like people love this game and people call it like one of the most beautiful games that ever existed. And I can kind of see why. So um, yeah, it's a, a lot of people would have snapped this up, put it that way. Yeah, this box set is beautiful. Yeah. It looks absolutely stunning. Apparently the orchestral tracks... Uh, from this BAFTA winning score. Right. So apparently this this music was award winning. Big deal. Um, then Data 17, Police Noughts. So Dan, this is a Hideo Kojima game. Oh, to, to my old mate. Stranding. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
I it's on my list of games that I want to play. Um, obviously, this is Kojima. Um, I never got around to it, uh, and a lot of um, people say if you like Hideo Kojima, you should play Police Knots because it is total Kojima craziness. Um, but it's actually quite old. Yeah. Apparently, it's from yeah. 1994. Yeah, Kojima's old, mate. <laughs> Metal Gear 1 was like 86 or something. Oh, God, yeah, I forgot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Been wow. around. Yeah, so he's done a, he's done a few. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is one that I really, really want to play. Um, I, I have no idea about the music, but that's all I can say about it. Well, the blurb makes it sound like something that'd be right up our alley. Mm. Blends together themes inspired by 80s buddy cop movies, crime mm. noir... Hard science fiction, complete with John Carpenter-esque synths. Yeah, Kojima, mate. This is, uh, this is all him. This is what he loves. All and downbeat, shit. smoky brass lines, reminiscent of Angelo Battle and Menti in Twin Peaks mode. Yeah. Zero That's got to be, be great. Be great. Yeah. I'm, I'm, honestly, I'm, I don't know. I haven't got it. I don't know how I can get it these days. It's just on an emulator or something, but I'm looking forward to playing it. Data 18. Thunder Force 4. Don't know it. No. This is an old 1992 Mega Drive game. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Not one that I ever played. No. Uh, another standalone release, Sonic CD. Um, it's not a CD. It's a three-disc vinyl release. <laughs> yes. So this was like, Sega CD didn't do very well, um, but this was like one of the key games right. for it. Um, when you, if you got the CD add-on for the Mega Drive or whatever. Um, and that, God, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, that. so there was like a handful of games. Like another one was like Dragon's Lair that was released for it. Um, and that was it. It didn't really do very well, but Sonic CD was like the one um, to get if you've got Sega CD. Um, yeah. And I never, I think I'd, I'd actually just lie, I probably would have played it because I remember my cousin had one, um, but I don't remember anything about it, let alone the music. But sure, why not? Why is it not part of the numbering system that bothers me? I don't know. What the bothers well, the, same, the other one wasn't, so. I feel like the Sonic Mania was like a, you know, it's not an old retro release. And Akami is like a, a modern thing. But Sonic CD is an old game. If anyone's listening from data discs, please, this is going to bother me. It's going to keep me up at night. <laughs> Can you put me out of my misery? Yes. Um, data 19, Radiant Silver Gun. Yes, now we're getting into the territory that I'm not too familiar with. I don't know Radiant Silver Gun. I've never heard of it. I don't recognise the artwork or anything. No, it's probably a Japanese thing. Um, uh, originally released in 1998 in the arcades and for the Sega Saturn console. So, yeah, anything basically after about 1994, I'm clueless. Well, Sega Saturn as well, like, I didn't have it. I didn't know anyone that had a Sega Saturn. So, right. yeah, it's just lost on me. Now, here's a proper, oh, my God, this is like iconic to me, this artwork, because, again, this is an early Mega Drive one, Alien Storm. Mm. Yeah, what do you remember about it? I never played it. But I love that cover, and it's so cool. Yeah, I um, don't think I ever played it either. Uh, I do vaguely remember the, as I was going to say, I do vaguely remember the artwork, same as you probably. Um, but I don't think I ever actually played it. And I'm just looking um, online, and yeah, I don't recall any of this. But sure, great. It, it's weird, and I love it. Why not? I want to play the hell out of this. And the slime green coloured vinyl is in stock. <laughs> right. Give it, give it a whirl. Uh, data color. 21. Alien Soldier. Yeah, don't know this one either, sorry. Alien Soldier. <laughs> Do you remember um, this one? No. 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 Uh, apparently it's 1995, the tail end of the Mega Drive's lifespan. Right. So yeah, it must be a really late Mega Drive game. Yeah, I don't ever, I don't remember anything about it. Look shit. Yeah. <laughs> it feels like they're going into a bit more obscure territory. I don't want to say clutching at straws or scraping the barrel, but. But maybe. 
Well, you say that, but then obviously coming up is a big one. But yeah, sorry. I don't know this next one either. What, Ikaruga? Ikaruga, yeah. That's the big one? No, it's not. The, the big oh. one's the next one after that. Ikaruga is uh, apparently the forerunner of Radiant Silver Gun. Ikaruga, Ikaruga. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, it's one of, it's one of those classic, um, the screen goes up, it's a shooter thing. Okay. Yeah, fine, whatever. Cool. I don't. I never really played those ones. People loved them. I wasn't too good at them. So, see ya. Data twenty three. Yeah, here we go. Shenmue two, yes, number two. Um, I think people were disappointed by the sequel when it came out. Um, to be honest. Uh, but yeah, no idea about the music. But as I said, people have a lot of love for this franchise. So why not get the second one out there? Um, it hasn't been released. This is up for pre-order. Oh. It's shipping uh, in three days' time. So you can Ooh. still still get in there and get your translucent green well, not me. or People your classic can't black. Either. This will be out in the future, so fuck it. It's probably sold out. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, um, we never know. And the only other thing they've done is they've made a really nice slip a case so that you can put your Shenmue and your Shenmue 2 in it. Mm, and maybe Shenmue together. 3. No, there's no room for that. <laughs> <laughs> if, they, if they do a Shenmue 3, you just have to leave it out on your... Just leave it out. Leave it out on your coffee table. Yeah. So that's their whole catalogue. Um, Sam, what would you like to see them release? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. I think like um I think you'd agree like the Toe Jam and L series would be a good one. Took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> you know I love Toe Jam and L is my favourite game of all time. What a surprise. And um, possibly my favourite soundtrack of all time. Um Do you know do you know anything about Herbie Hancock? Yes. Well, as in the name and some of the music, but not nothing more. He went through so many different like uh, styles of jazz, right? And basically, in the was it like mid seventies, yeah, mm-hmm. mid to late seventies, he had a band called the Headhunters, right? Um, and that album, Headhunters, is like really big, iconic album of like jazz funk. Mm-hmm. And that is what the Toe Jam and Earl soundtrack is based on. Like some like probably like nerdy guy, just basically. Making that music on a synthesizer and making it better. Yeah. <laughs> well, sure. Why not? I mean, the but only other things so I was good. thinking was um, just like looking through some stuff. Like the Mortal Kombat series might be interesting. Yeah. Um, that's kind of it, really. I'm not really too bothered about any other stuff. Like, hmm. <laughs> like maybe like, I don't know, like Echo the Dolphin. What would that be like now? God. I want to play. That's on the Mega Drive Mini. I, I've, I've never I actually played it ever. I remember um, our friend Bradley had it, and it was like the one game they had. And it's like I can only play this game so much. Yeah, <laughs> they pushed it so hard, didn't they? Yeah, they did. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was it was one of those things where it's like water. So the, graphically, it was quite stunning for the time. Yeah, um, it's a bit but different. I, they wanted to make him like a franchise character, and it's like it's just a dolphin. Yeah, it's a dolphin who has who's just going around trying not to get hit by sharks or whatever. Yeah. It's not even like an anthropomorphic dolphin, you know, it's not like Sonic. It's, it's actually a dolphin. It's Literally a dolphin. a dolphin in the sea just trying to survive. Um, that was cool, though, going through all that. That's uh, bring back some memories. So you'd say Toe Jam and L then, that'd be your choice as well. Yeah, uh, Data Disc, if you're listening, we want Toe Jam and L. Mm, yeah. Do it. Do it, do it, do it. <laughs> Um, um, cool. Should we have a little break and listen to a tiny bit of Toe Jam and Earl music? And when we come back, <laughs> Sam is going to tell us all about why he loves Outrun. <laughs> Welcome back, and Sam, hmm. tell us about the 
record you've picked from uh, data discs so, lovely catalog yeah so outrun as i've said before um it just reminded me of the super sunny like party carefree uh ness of being young and beautiful um <laughs> and the fact that like when you're playing this game it's all moving really fast you're in a you know big um like cool car and it doesn't really matter if you die or whatever or if you lose it's just like you're just there for the sheer fun of it and that kind of comes through in the music i think as well so the one um uh kind of going through it a little bit so i think we should take a listen to magical sound shower um and see what you think So Dan, I'd be interested in your first thoughts on Magical Sound Shower, which sounds horrible as a title. But, uh... <laughs> that was absolutely lovely. I really was getting into that. Really good fun. I was really surprised when the drums came in, actually, how much they sounded like drums. Because <laughs> yeah. um, it still sounds quite, you know, uh, 8-bitty. I, I, well, I'm talking about 16-bit game, right? But it sounds it yeah. sound a bit 8-bitty compressed and tinny in places but parts of it sounded really nice but i mean overall yeah really like such a nice like you say sunny happy upbeat vibe yeah definitely it sounds like i'm on holiday yeah it's really 80s i think with this track in particular it's got um i quite like the melody um the fact it's also like it's a bit jazzy and there's like some kind of jamaican kind of party vibes or something yeah. <laughs> it just totally fits that game's aesthetic and as you said um uh about it being <laughs> Uh, it is very upbeat and stuff. I don't know if it's California. Um, it does still, yeah, there's that definitely that Japanese vibe still there. Totally, totally. It really makes me think of, I don't want to like take this off on a big other tangent, but I've been listening to quite a bit of this like 80s Japanese city pop right. over the last year. You listen to, do you know no, about this? this no. it? It's kind of like, I think it's like artists who like throughout the 70s in Japan like there was a, a break with like traditional Japanese music mm. and they, you know, were having more influence from America, um, especially like rock and roll. Um, so you've got these artists who were kind of like trying to emulate a lot of these like, yeah, Western sounds and like especially pop music, but also kind of like fusing it with like modern Japanese jazz. Right. Um, particularly guys like Tatsuro Yamashita, mm -hmm. who was like a big Beach Boys fan. Um, so yeah, they're kind of doing this like, it's almost like, it's almost cheesy. Right. Um, like t 10 years ago, I just said it's awful. It just sounds terrible. It's just like really upbeat, shimmery, cheesy kind of pop. But yeah, I appreciate the sort of subtleties of it now a bit more and the... It's, there's a very distinctive vibe. And it's just, yeah, there's something, I really find it hard to put my finger on what it is about it. Mm. Um, maybe it's the nostalgia. I don't know, but it this, reminds me of this really sounds like, yeah, okay. like city pop. That's interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe that was, that was part of it. There's some other, like, that's, this. it's a bit hit and miss, um, the rest of the songs. There's Passing Breeze which is a bit like lounge music. It's not quite as cool as the first ones, but like a cheesy cruise band or something. Um, Splash Wave, which doesn't really do anything for me, I don't think. Uh, Last Wave, which was a lot better, and it's basically a bare bones version of Splash Wave. It's just got some simple keyboards. It's much nicer. It's almost like a game over screen, which you might well have been. Um, it's a bit dreamy. Uh, Step on Beat, which is it says Mega Drive, so I'm guessing this is uh, for a Mega Drive version they're off of the game which is great. It sounds like a chip tune, James Brown or something, like a bit of a soul classic. <laughs> um, there's, I think it's Cruising Line for the 3DS. Um, uh, and there's this one in Camino a Mi Amor. Um, Cruising Line feels a bit like, actually feels very Nintendo, even though Sega, or oh, I don't know if it's Sega actually, but um, uh, it's a bit more bright and sunny. It's got more of a salsa vibe, which I always feel like Nintendo always go with, um, with their games. Uh, I see, like everyone, of... everyone's doing the conga kind of like music. <laughs> it feels like with Nintendo sometimes in their music. I think it's one guy who does all their music. Uh, 
Well, I just saw, saw that. This this was done by like a staffer. Right. A Sega staffer. Uh, what's his name? Hiroshi Hiro Kawaguji. Perfect, I wonder what else perfect he did. pronunciation. Um, <laughs> and yeah, the last one is, yeah, Camino Amiamor. And that sounds a bit darker. It's a bit longer as well, that one, uh, which is pretty good. Um, so yeah, that's quite interesting. If people want to go search that out, why not? Sounds like lots of jazzy vibes in there. Like you mentioned, mm-hmm. a bit of like James Brown-esque funk, some salsa, a bit of Latin flavor. Yeah. I think going in, I thought it was going to be a lot cooler rather than party-ish. Like yeah. a, less like rumber on the beach. And I thought it was going to be more like <laughs> cruising down the sunset, uh, like the Pacific Coast Highway or whatever, um, which wasn't the case. Dan, what have you, what have you picked? I've gone for the best beat em up uh, of all time Streets of Rage 2. Nice. Which track? Which track? The whole thing, mate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean to play now yeah. for people to hear? Yeah, yeah. Let's have a little bit of Alien Power. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, this game, you know, I just love this game. It's great. Um, The first game, the soundtrack is brilliant as well, but he just takes it up a notch with this soundtrack. And, you know, since I bought this disc and been listening to it, I did do a bit of reading. And yeah, like I said earlier, you know, some of these these soundtracks have come to a bit more uh, like prominence Mm. uh, and eminence. So this one's by a guy called Yuzo Koshiro. Um, he was born in 1967 in Japan, uh, Tokyo. Nice. Um, and he kind of like started off in the 80s, I think. But his first um, work for Sega was Revenge of Shinobi. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was 1989. And I have got a copy of that, actually, Data Discs. Okay. But I haven't listened to it yet. Right. Um, yeah, so Streets of Rage, you know... Uh, it's bare knuckle in Japan. Mm-hmm. That came out in 1991, and Streets of Rage 2 was 1992. Right. And like, what I love about this is it's so diverse. Um, you know, like just just playing the game. Like, forget about listening to it as a standalone piece of music. Like, it's so fitting for the game. You know, it's so like amped and pumped and exciting, and it goes through so many different like moods. You know, there's the more like downbeat, almost like this kind of outrun music mm. of like when you're on like the level where you're like walking on the beach. Um, and then suddenly like like the boss music is so intense. Like it was exhilarating stuff. Um, and yeah, I mean, it is really, you know, you don't realize it as a kid when you're playing, but I really do think it was part of the whole package and the appeal of the game. Mm-hmm. It brought so much. Um, doing a bit of reading around him, um, he was interviewed in 1992 and he said his favourite music genres were new wave, dance music, techno pop, classical and hard rock. And I think you can hear all of that in this music. Um, he said his favourite Western bands were Van Halen and Soul to Soul. Weird. What weird combo. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I loved that. And um, yeah, it feels like he like really pushed the envelope here. Um, people have gone on record now and like said, like you know, now they're looking back and saying like how amazing this was. Mm. Um, you know, both from a technical standpoint and from a, mu- a musical standpoint. So, like, I just grabbed something here off of the internet. I'm just going to read it out. Mm-hmm. Um, but people say like they're influenced by house, techno, hardcore techno, breakbeat, funk like Latin jazz, various other like pieces of ethnic music. Um, he even tries to like reproduce like Roland 
like sounds and beats yeah. using like really old synthesizers. He was using equipment that was like 10 years old at that time, yeah. like pushing it to its absolute limit. Mm. Um, but he did also like develop his own kind of like system for recording. Because like what you'll, you'll hear on this is like the, the quality of the instrumentation, like the richness of the sound. Like it's unbelievable that he managed to get all of this onto a, onto like a cartridge. Yeah. Crazy. Um, like people still kind of go like, how did he do it? It's amazing. It's like an hour's <laughs> worth as well, right? Yeah. A, a lot of people say like you can, and you can complete the game in an hour. Mm. And I saw someone saying like, is, is the reason why the soundtrack's like so good and immediate is because uh, like you don't hear it multiple times over the course of the game. Mm. It is almost like he had to write an album with a running time of an hour. Mm. And it's got like a coherent flow to it, which is like the flow of the emotion of the game. Mm -hmm. um, he, uh, yeah, so like people have said, you know, it's just an amazing blend of all these like genres of like dance music, basically. And in many ways predicts things right. that then didn't happen until like the mid nineties okay. in dance music. And that, yeah, like listening to it like without without playing the game, just like listening to a standalone piece of music. I am like like this sounds a little bit like maybe like what the Prodigy were doing, like around music uh, for the Jilted Generation, mm -hmm. which would have been like two years. years later. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I just I think you know it's amazing, and people have said like you know it sounds more like music you'd hear in a nightclub, mm. and they are some like modern guy who's like a, a staff writer for like Noisy. Right. Yeah. You know, you know like, he's a DJ. Like, can you imagine like any of these songs like slotting into a like a DJ set? And he's like, absolutely. Like, you drop this, people are gonna go go like mad for it. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think that. Well, I thought like um, listening back to it just now, uh, it was mightily impressive. I didn't actually expect it to be that good, um, uh, and I could see why it's so popular. I genuinely really enjoyed it. Oh man, that's, that's good to hear. Um, yeah, I really it really stands up as a like a piece of music on its own. Mm. Um, let's have another track, yeah. Okay, a little section of something. Here we go. <laughs> Isn't it? What is it called? Like uh, under logic. Mm. I love the you know you're playing the game. It just makes you feel good, you know. And it's like a mid tempo kind of one. You just got that swagger, and you're literally just like strolling through, beating up bad guys, mm. eating apples. <laughs> <laughs> it was very like had a real like nineties edge to it, which I really yeah. enjoyed. Um, that was great. That was a really good, uh, really good listen. It's cool, right? And. Um, yeah, like I said, this one, I think the Streets of Rage are kind of like the backbone of Data Discs catalogue. Because like I said, the first uh, thing they released was the first game soundtrack. And that's really good as well. That's well worth checking out. Um, you know, it's got everything that this one has. But I would say, yeah, he just managed to like uh, build on it with the second one. Mm. And it's got a little bit more depth, I think, of sound quality. And a little bit more variation. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that one, Streets of Rage 2, I think it's been pressed quite a few times. I've got the uh, Frosted Clear. Okay. So it's two discs. Oh, it's so nice. Like, it comes with some like really nice prints inside, a big fold-out thing of the like original like Japanese game art from Bare Knuckle. Right. Um, yeah, so cool. And obviously he went on to do... Streets of Rage 3, mm -hmm. um, which apparently wasn't all that well received, the soundtrack to that. Apparently got like a bit more experimental. I haven't heard it, so I'd be quite quite curious. Again, people now look back and say, oh, actually it was ahead of its time. Yeah. 
Interesting. Um, uh, yeah, I've probably, um, I might give it a purchase, to be honest. That's well worth it. If you, you know, you've got a nice little set of like video game music collecting on vinyl, you know, you should definitely add this. Why not? Why this, not? this is the best, the best of everything they've, they, they've released, I reckon. It's nice to well only pay it. a little bit for um, delivery as well. Yeah. I noticed as well, because of Brexit, they can't deliver anything to anyone in the EU at the moment. Yeah, it's happening everywhere. It's ridiculous. Uh, um, yeah, because there was Laced Records as well, who do stuff, video game music, um, put a big thing out, just basically going, yeah, we can't, like, send you anything <laughs> um, if, you're in, if you're in the EU. Uh, yeah. Oh, Brexit as well. Oh, typical. What are you typical? Um, um, the other thing with data discs as well that's quite nice is that it's all on vinyl. They don't make it available to download. You don't get a download code. Mm. So, you know, you're going to listen to it on vinyl. And I like that. Um, and I think that's purely, they said, because of legal reasons. So I suppose they've got rights to press this stuff onto vinyl, but they haven't got digital distribution rights. But they do seem to have acquired them for Streets of Rage 2. Sorry, Streets of Rage, Streets of Rage 2 and Streets of Rage 3. Um, So all of those. And again, like just going into like the level of care and quality, they haven't just stuck up the masters that they've pressed onto vinyl. They've remastered these again specifically for digital. Okay. So yeah, really nice. And you can download those from their Bandcamp page. Uh, I personally won't be paying to download these. <laughs> I feel a bit like uh, maybe they should contact people that bought the vinyl in the past and like give them a free download or something. Yeah. But, um, there you go. Uh, but yeah, if you're not into vinyl and you want to hear specifically this this soundtrack, yeah, go on their Bandcamp page, datadiscs.bandcamp.com. Um, it's like six pounds or something. Even if you're in the EU, I think you can get it. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, that's really cool going through that, Dan. I really, really enjoyed that. Yeah, I enjoyed that too. That was good. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I would love to at some point do Streets of Rage 2, the game, properly. That would be fun. Yeah, we can put it on the list. So I guess like talking about the list and stuff, we're, we're kind of picking what we want to do now because the randomizer was just, um, it, was, it was still being, you know, still working. But um, I think for the sake of time, and all this stuff we've just been picking stuff that we're we're gonna do. However, we um we will be using the randomizer for any anyone who wants to uh send in um recommendations of stuff to us to cover. We might just cover it. If we get a bunch, we'll put them into a randomizer and then when we feel like doing something a bit different, we'll use it. And um yours can be in the mix. So make sure you do get in contact with us uh if you wish. Um talking about games, Dan, uh our next episode will be on a plague's tale. Innocence, I think that's what it's called. <laughs> wow. The actual term. It's a, um, for those who don't know, it's released a couple of years ago. And I played it recently and completed it, so I thought I might as well talk about it. Um, it's set in like 1600s France, I guess. And you play um, a, a teenage girl, or, or woman, I should say, who is... Or concubine. Uh, yes, who um, is walking around with her brother um and basically the whole of france it seems like has been overtaken by rats um your one ally is light so if you stay in the light you're safe if you get in the dark the rats will get you and they will immediately kill you and eat you wow at the same time you're trying to hide from these people who want to kidnap your brother for reasons you don't find out till later on in the game um it's great really good game actually uh looks really nice as well so um check uh check it out if you can i played it on an xbox game pass um uh which is a subscription service xbox xbox do for those who have xbox if you want to play it and complete it um you know before we start talking about it then cool otherwise come back next time and we will be chatting about it so i guess that's it anything you want to add dan yeah all right All right, thanks everyone, and see you next time. Goodbye. Bye. Hey guys, 
thank you for listening to Oddcast Movies, Music and Gaming. If you want to get in touch with us or get a movie, album or game put on our list to discuss, then email us at oddcastoddballs at gmail.com or a new winter podcast at gmail.com. This is part of a new winter podcast network, so head on over to a new winter.net to check out our other shows. You can also follow us on Instagram at a new winter, Twitter at a new winter, and you can head on over to our Patreon page, patreon.com slash a new winter. Thanks for listening and see you again soon.